Michael, uh, this is a fun time. Uh, spring season fixing to begin. And we wanted to kind of touch base with you, just talk about the state of the program, kind of introduce you um, and give a little bit of an introduction about the team. Um, let me, first off, how are you doing? How's, how, how was the holidays? You, you back and going now? Yeah, it was definitely, uh, you know, a different holiday. So appreciate you, you checking in with us. Um, enjoyed the time with the family. Um, you know, wasn't able to, to travel like normal to see some, some extended family, but, but very thankful to have my in-laws living here and, uh, to be able to spend time with my wife and the, and the girls. Um, uh, so it was, I think the first year that, that Jojo really understood Christmas and Santa and presents and everything. So that was a lot of fun. Um, you know, uh, also had, had the privilege of having a lot of the players around. Um, so it was a, definitely a different type of December, uh, early January than we're used to with so many guys here and, and training hungry to, to start the year. So it was a, definitely a balance of, of uh, voluntary workouts and family time, um, but enjoyed it very much. Um, I think very excited to, to get going here soon. Michael, just looking at your career, obviously you, you've made different stops along the way, but seem to be building toward becoming a head coach, named interim head coach at Baylor um, last July. Um, what's that transition been like? Um, you know, how have you, you know, kind of uh, approached that, you know, this this new title and the new role? Yeah, it's been, uh, you know, definitely a, a wild ride, uh, I think, over the, the past four plus years um, and just a, an incredible experience here at Baylor. Um, certainly, you know, when I got into coaching, I, I wanted to, to be a head coach eventually and, and you know, at, at a high level where, where I had a, a, a great platform um, to impact young lives. I think the, the older I get, the more um, driven I am in that regard. Um, and so it's been building. I think, you know, it's something that I think about that I've been preparing for that my mentors have been helping me with, uh, to make sure that at any moment I'm ready. I mean, I had this situation happen a couple of years ago where I was interim for a couple of weeks. And so I had a little bit of a taste of that. And I think how I handled it, um, helped in that I just, I, I wasn't trying to jump ship. I just thought, okay, let me hunker down here and try to help the guys. Uh, make sure, you know, in this time of, of uncertainty that they're as well taken care of as possible. Um, and I think that's how I've reacted um, this time as well, um, obviously for a, a more extended role. Um, and, you know, it, it's been a lot of fun. And I would say most, uh, most credit needs to be um, given to the staff that's been around me, the administration and, and the players. I mean, they've all um, been so supportive. They've been so positive, excited to, to be here, to be working with this program, uh, to be a part of the program. And I think that's made the transition so much easier. Uh, I think it could be, you know, given different people around me, it could be a completely different situation. Kind of addressed it there, but um, in terms of maybe any specific people that have helped you in the transition, maybe even calling on or leaning on. I know you have some coaching mentors, anybody either here at Baylor or some of your mentors that have helped you with this situation. Uh, it's probably too many to name, um, you know, but I think there's the, they're the obvious ones around here. Um, you know, obviously Max has been very supportive. Um, Jeremiah, you know, I'm very excited for him that he's going to be in a leading role at Boise State, um, but he's, He's been a great mentor for me. Um, Kenny has been so busy with with COVID and health and wellness and everything, but he's he's always taken the time to check in on the program and make sure everything um, is you know that that I have or that we need is taken care of. I'm really appreciative of him. Um, John Mauer has been an amazing mentor for us. Um, you know, not just me, but for the entire staff and the team. Very appreciative of everything he, he's been doing. And, Outside of that, um, you know, the more interesting ones, I would say that, you know, aren't the obvious uh, answers. 
Uh, Coach Doherty uh, at Valpo, who I played for and coached with, has just been a constant supporter of our program, um, has been a constant supporter of me, giving me feedback, giving me, um, you know, thoughts on, on the team and what we should do and um, how we should do it. And just, he just loves to talk about it um, and to talk shop and see how I'm doing and how I'm growing, how my family's doing in the team. And so he's been a huge support. Uh, one person that, that people probably wouldn't know is, is Coach Hans Olsen, uh, who's now the, the head coach for the women's program at U UNC Wilmington. Um, he's been a huge uh, supporter of mine and a great mentor since my time at NC State as a, stu as a student. Um, and he talks to me all the time. He is a big driver. I mean, I have my, uh, my value system on my wall and designed with him uh, be, you know, because of him. He's been preparing me for this moment for, for many years, uh, and, and he's been a consistent support for me. Um, and then honestly, my dad has been, a, a, you know, he's, he's here, he's, he's a head coach. He's been a head coach at, at many levels uh, since the early 2000s. Um, and so, uh, I mean, I, I can talk to him. He, can, he gives me his honest feedback all the time on, um, on everything. Even though we coach different sports, I think I'm, I'm constantly learning from the things that he's doing and the successes that he's had. Um, and he's come from a player's perspective too, um, which I have uh, so much respect for. I think, you know, I'm coming from a, I've just had more of a coaching lens um, and he's such a great, uh, he was such a great player um, to move on to coach, to coaching and had success in that. He, and he's a great game manager. And so I try to use the, the player's perspective as a coach, as well as the game manager lens that he has. Um, and so very thankful for, for our relationship and, Finally, uh, and most obviously my wife, I mean, she drives, she was such a successful player and coach at University of San Diego and then Valpo. I mean, I, there's not a day that goes by that I don't go home and say, oh, this is what happened. What do you think? Or this is what I'm thinking. What should we do? Um, you know, they've, she's been unbelievably supportive and in a, you know, very busy time. So, and she, you know, she knows that she knows coaching, she knows playing at a high, high level of, of collegiate sports. So, uh, just very thankful uh, for her and, and her support and guidance. I think a lot of the things that we do around here has uh, you know, her stamp on it. Michael, I know that you and I have talked about it. I've read your story and stuff, but um, talk about how you became, obviously coaching is in your blood, seems like, um, and certainly around you everywhere. But how did you decide to become a tennis coach? Because I if I remember right, it seems like you were studying for something else and then I made that switch. Yeah, I was uh, definitely gearing up for, uh, there's some debate, you know, I was thinking medical school. I originally went to school to, to be a veterinarian. Uh, when I transferred to Valparaiso, uh, they didn't have pre-vet programs there. So I thought I'm going to go pre-med, um, fulfill all the requirements, and then um, either take the MCAT or uh, you go back at somewhere else where I can, can finish off the pre-vet, um, requirements. And so I definitely had no plans of coaching, uh, at the time that my mom passed away. Um, this is actually, you know, a picture of her right here. Um, you know, uh, she's a, was a very supportive person in my life and, and wanted all me to always be happy and was, you know, always expressed how, proud of, of me she was and definitely built me up um, from a confidence standpoint and uh, when when she passed you know I thought to where are my skills and what would I love to do um, I, I didn't know how I was going to handle that with, with her loss my senior year in college and and so I um, you know I was fortunate enough coach Doherty said hey you know if you want to uh, if you want to be the assistant coach next year, you can get your master's. You can be here where it's comfortable. My dad was the coach there. My little brother and sister and my stepmom were all there in Valpo. And it was just a great place for me to grieve and kind of recover. Um, and I just hit the ground running. I, I, I was tutoring and I taught classes and I taught tennis. So I loved to teach. My mom was a teacher. My dad was a coach. So it, it made total sense. I knew that I would love it. I just never thought I would be able to make it a, uh, a career. You know, you see people like my father. My father was a World Series champion and then got into coaching. And I, I was a mediocre Division One tennis player. Uh, I, I never thought, I thought my, my um, skills were best served uh, maybe in the medical field or something, something else. Um, but 
you know, God had a plan for me that was very different than I was expecting. And, um, you know, I've, I've really dove in uh, and loved every minute of it since. Um, and, and he led me here to Baylor and, and couldn't be more thankful for, for that. If it makes you feel any better, my choir, direct, choir director once told me, because I, I said something about maybe joining the choir, he said, and I was doing soundboard, he said, we think you're where you need to be. So <laughs> sometimes, you know, we, we get what we want, sometimes we don't. Um, Michael, is there a particular book, a quote, something that sticks out that really, you know, resonates with you in terms of your coaching philosophy? I've, I've honestly read so many books um, recently, especially credit to Spencer Furman, who's one of our grad transfers, who reads, I don't know how many hours a day, but it's so many hours that I can't possibly keep up. Um, I'm like, Spencer, you don't have a wife and kids at home that you go to home to and have to, you know, uh, spend a lot of time with and, and, and uh, play with and they don't want to read with me. Uh, and so, but I'm trying everything that I can. I'm losing sleep at night trying to keep up with all the books that he's, he's crushing. Um, but one that's a little off the beaten path um, used to be called Walk on Life from the End of the Bench. It's now called Teammates Matter, uh, written by Alan Williams. Alan Williams uh, played basketball at Wake Forest University. Uh, I had the privilege of watching him um, speak to our FCA when I was in high school um, in, in Raleigh, North Carolina. And he, uh, he made me want to be him. He made me want to go to college, be the worst player on the team, and make a difference and just, you know, do things that change the world through, you know, his, uh, his eyes. And, I mean, he had such a, a great Christian message, but he also just, he suffered because he played on teams with, uh, Eric Williams and Justin Gray and Josh Howard and then you know Chris Paul came after and and he was the worst guy on the team he was the you know he tells a story about there's 10 seconds left and they're up by eight and his coach he overhears his coach saying is there anything Allen can do to screw this up uh, and you know I'm thinking I want to be that guy I'm going to find a way to make a difference because he used his platform he's to to change the world and do so much good um, and now he's got, you know, he, he travels and speaks. He's got a whole, um, you know, uh, uh, business built off of, of this Teammates Matter um, uh, agenda. And I think it's really cool. I mean, he drove me to want to, to play college athletics. I think that that's led me indirectly to, to being here. So uh, that's a great book for anybody, even those that aren't big readers. I, I recommend Teammates Matter by Alan Williams. Fantastic read. Very easy, enjoyable uh, for, for readers of all levels and very inspirational. Um, and then I think for a quote, there's a lot of great quotes out there, but one I typically live by is, um, the players don't care how much, you know, until they know how much you care. Uh, and we try to live by that uh, every day here. Um, it's, it, it's so much more than just coaching tennis. It's so much more than the X's and O's of pouring back and serves returns. It's, it's about building relationships with these young men and helping them um, become the best that they can be on and off the court as, as, as individuals. Uh, um, this is a kind of reality show world that we're living in. I think two, 2020 was reality, right? <laughs> yes. Um, we're going to, we're going to strand you on a deserted Island for a hundred days outside of your family. What, uh, what three staff members or players would you want with you on that island with you and why? I think the I think the good news is no one comes to mind that I absolutely don't want to be on a stranded island with uh, from staff to players. Uh, but I think I, I would be uh, I would be cheating myself if I didn't say uh, Jackie, Isaac and George, um, I, the three staff members that I work with day in and day out. Um, they're unbelievable. I mean, when you talk about staff, best staff in the country, I mean, if you remove me from the equation, we have the best staff in the nation for, for tennis programs. I mean, Jackie does an incredible job. She runs this place. The building would not, it, it would not function without her. Um, these guys are incredibly fortunate to have her, um, just her willingness to, to help and be a resource. And I would say if I was on a deserted island, I wouldn't know what to do without Jackie for sure. So we need to have her. Um, <laughs> Isaac is incredibly resourceful, um, very knowledgeable. He's so interested in, in everything, you know, not just tennis, but but all, all areas of life that I think he would, would certainly provide 
um, a, a lot of knowledge um, and, and resourcefulness if we were stuck on an island. So I very much would need him. And, and George just doesn't stop. Uh, he is, he's got so much energy and he's the first one to dive into any activity uh, or anything that we need to get done. So uh, if we were stranded on a desert island, I feel like George would have the house built by nightfall. Um, we, you know, with somehow with electricity and running hot water and everything. So I feel like if I had those three around me, we would be living a good life. So um, I, I think I would, I would have to say those three. All right, Michael, let's uh, shift gears a little bit and start talking about the 2020-21 team. Uh, return 11 players off of last year's team um, and added three graduate transfers, five players that have sp spent significant time at that number one singles position at different places. And the team boasts one of the top double pairings in the nation in Sven Law and Connie Franson. Um, I, I was thinking about going back to the five slam a jamma days at U of H where they talked about Guy V. Lewis, all he had to do was roll out the balls. Um, I won't say that about you, but uh, in terms of, would you, are you just going to flip a coin? How do you, how do you pick a lineup with that much talent? We've had uh, vast discussions uh, and they've heated up over the last couple of days as we try to figure out, you know, go home, going home and asking my wife, what am I going to do with him? What am I going to do with him? Where do I put this guy? Um, I mean, flipping a coin might make more sense than what we're doing right now. So I would definitely feel comfortable flipping a coin and just rolling with that. I think it would make it a little bit uh, <laughs> more relaxing. Uh, you just kind of play where the chips fall. Um, and I think that we have that kind of flexibility uh, this year. I mean, it's, it's unprecedented the, the amount of experience and success and talent that these young men have. Uh, and I, it's going to be on us to just keep them all together and moving forward. Um, if, if we could do that, the, um, the success and the, the results will take care of themselves. We're really focused on the process. Um, the guys are, they just have a joy for, for playing, playing the game every day that I haven't seen before um, to this extreme. I mean, the guys are just, they're practicing like it's their last day ever. Uh, and that is a lot of fun. You, you, sometimes you get older guys that are, you know, one foot out the door or they've accomplished things before. And, and the combination of the returners, the older guys that we have here with the, with the new guys that have come in, um, that are just so appreciative of everything that we're doing here, just so happy to be here, that it's, a, it's really like lightning in a bottle. And then you get the young guys that are just trying to keep up um, and so excited to be learning from the older guys and competing against them every day, trying to take them down. I mean, it's been a lot of fun to be around. Um, and so just really excited for this, for the season ahead. Obviously a lot of talent. What do you see as maybe some of the biggest strengths of this team? I think their maturity is, is high. And I think it has to be given this type of a, a situation, you know, with all the players on the team uh, and, and all the talent, you know, there's gonna be a lot of guys that are gonna have roles that aren't necessarily what they signed up for, uh, as well as with the virus situation. You know, I mean, the, the sacrifices that these young men are gonna have to make as college students is very different than what's, what they've had, they would have had to previously. They can't be around each other as much. They can't be around other people as much. Um, you know, they're really making a decision about, you know, how much do they socialize versus how much do they play tennis. Um, and, and it's really one or the other at a time like this to give themselves the best chance to have a full season. And I think they're just so mature um, and, and positive, just happy to, to be around each other. I think that's a huge strength. And you just can't put a price on uh, experience. I mean, we've got, you know, four guys that are fifth year seniors. We've got one that's a sixth year senior. We've got two true seniors, two true juniors. Uh, that's a lot of, I mean, that's a lot of experience right there. And they've all played significant time over four to six years. Um, so I, I think we're going to lean heavily on that when it matters the most. I know different coaches have different opinions about doubles. How much stock do you put in that? I mean, I know it's only one point or only counts one point. And then what are the keys? How do you find the best pairings for doubles? That's a great question. We do put, put a lot of stock in the doubles. I think it's a huge piece of the puzzle as far as momentum goes. And I think guys just love to play the doubles. I mean, it's, it's so much fun. There's so much energy. It's fast paced. It's great for the fans. 
Um, and it, it really does get you off on the right foot. And just feeling like you go out there and you have the best chance to win the doubles point uh, at all three spots is a big deal. I, I think it really sets the tone for a dual match, especially as you get further along um, in the in conference play and into the NCAA tournament. Um, and so we put a lot of stock into it. I would say we practice it more in the spring, um, you know, then, and then in the fall, it falls a little bit more about individual development. But we, we put the guys together. They, they enjoyed it in doing it. They enjoy playing. Um, and it, we think it really helps their singles game um, to, to, spend, to spend time playing dubs. Um, and honestly, from a from a strategy perspective about who to play together, guys click typically. Um, you can just see it. Um, they they either like each other a lot off the court. Um, they all of a sudden their their game styles mesh. I think you just have to put different guys together enough times, and something will happen, and you'll just kind of see it. And it, and it is important to build rapport with each other to have those repetitions together and. Um, so that's something we'll certainly pay attention to that we've been working hard on um, since we've returned from the break as well. And I think it's coming together nicely. Um, you know, we're going to need more options than normal. So that's something we've been paying attention to. If somebody gets out for contact tracing or test positive or an injury, you know, we're going to need guys to be comfortable playing with two or three different people. And we'll, we're going to try to plan for that as well. Um, but, but excited about what we have on the doubles court. Lots of experience, lots of guys that have played very you know, uh, at a very high national level. So uh, it should be a lot of fun. I think you described yourself as a mediocre division one tennis player, maybe. Well, it was very generous of me to do that for myself. Yes. <laughs> so you. uh, you're playing doubles. Anybody in their prime, who would you want to play with? <laughs> Any, I mean, there's a lot of players that would have made me look a lot better on the tennis court. Um, but I, I would say better. Uh, just because I'm, so, I grew up such a huge Roger Federer fan. I mean, I can remember screaming at the television. I still do it, you know, screaming at the television uh, for him uh, for hours and hours and hours. So it would just be a huge honor uh, to to play next to him. I think even today, it doesn't have to be in his prime. I think just to share the court with him would just be an amazing honor. And um, so uh, it, there are a lot of guys I would love to play some doubles with because I, I loved playing doubles in college. I think yeah, I preferred it over singles, just the camaraderie and the, the energy. But I think I would have to go with Fed. Good choice not to pick me, by the way. Uh, <laughs> hey, I'd be happy to do that too. Let's 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 share a court together sometime. Um, different world. Um, you know, we've been affected by the pandemic for quite a while. Just when you think it's getting better, maybe spikes the other way. What kind of things have you had to do in terms of uh, practice, practice routines, handling that, um, having all the guys, what, how do you change things to maybe keep yourself safer for, for COVID? It's been very different, honestly. Um, and I think, you know, credit to the staff, uh, to administration for, for riding that line of making sure that we're providing uh, all of the safety precautions necessary, making the sacrifices that we can to give these young men an opportunity to compete. Uh, so I think we've, we've done an excellent job. I'm so appreciative of everybody, um, you know, kind of finding that balance and, and allowing our guys to, to train and compete. That being said, I mean, we, we don't use the locker rooms right now. Um, you know, we are not really spending much time inside um, in general, you know, the team meetings are via Zoom. We don't really have team meals together right now. Um, we're spending a lot of time outside and we, we keep socially distanced. We, we try to keep the guys um, separated into their dwelling groups. I would say our guys live in more different places than we've ever had before. And partly by design, there's six different places the guys live. Um, that way, if, if anybody were to test positive or come in close contact, it's it, the whole team is not at risk. It's just a couple of guys. Um, and so I think that's been um, a, a sound adjustment for us as a team. Uh, but it is, it's very different. We can't do a lot of the team bonding exercises that we typically do. We can't spend time together in a room meeting like we normally would. And it takes a lot of maturity um, and, and great leadership from our older guys in order to be able to handle that and remain close, to work on building strong relationships, to love your, your doubles partner, to love your teammates, to love the guy next to you um, when, when you haven't spent that much time together. 
And so I think, you know, credit to the guys. It's been a lot different uh, than we're used to. And it's going to be a lot different. You know, we're not going to have as many fans. We're not, um, you know, going to have the setup like we have in the past. But um, I think it's, you know, we have the type of team to be able to handle it successfully. Uh, so I'm, I'm very thankful for that. You mentioned the fans there, which obviously they can create a huge home court advantage. I've seen it happen. I've seen the fans make an impact. Uh, as we're still trying to finalize attendance plans for matches and, and different events this spring, what are some ways that fans can stay involved, even if they can't be at the Herd or the Hawkins this season? Uh, hopefully we'll be able to have, uh, you know, a decent number of fans there. I think every person in the building at, at, at Hawkins at Herd makes a difference. I mean, we, we love, the guys love playing in front of the crowd. They love playing for, for their Baylor, Baylor family. Um, and so that is hugely important. And I know it'll be very limited, especially at Hawkins, but um, excited for, for who can be there uh, to make a difference. Um, that being said, you know, following along with social media, uh, engaging the guys um, on social media and the program, um, you know, we've we've got, you know, different types of, of things going on throughout the semester that we're doing as far as giveaways and and different uh, social media activities that should engage uh, our fan base. Um, that in addition to that, we've, you know, our baseline club is really important. There's there's not been a more important time um, and need for support um, from our from our Baylor family. Um, you know, our baseline club you can access uh, on our Baylor uh, men's tennis website. Uh, it's you know right up at the top. It says give to to men's tennis. Uh, I think that's you know something that we are so appreciative of. We've had a lot of new members um, over the past few months. And you know we've we've been doing newsletters out to to all those members in the in the club as well as uh, different perks for for joining the club. I think um, that's been really fun to be able to get to know more uh, fans of the program as well as to kind of give them an inside look as to what's going on here within the program on a on a month to month basis. Um, and so you know engaging every single person that's interested in our program and growing that base um, with both within the baseline club and beyond. I think will make a huge difference for these guys. So the motivation that that they're making a difference and that they're having an impact across the country and throughout the world um, really will push these guys over the edge. I think it's a huge deal. So all the support we can, can get matters. Awesome. In one of those time flies moments, you're now in your fifth season, fifth year at Baylor. Hard, hard to believe it's, I mean, time does fly. Um, but is there a favorite moment favorite match you know, other than this fireside chat is there a favorite <laughs> moment at Baylor that you've had I, you know I mean I, honestly I was I was thinking about this yesterday and the staff was talking about it we think so much about the results and I have two that stand out that I'll share with you the moments that we just spend with the guys whether it's traveling meals together out on the practice court where we have tough moments and then you see something kind of switch uh, and they overcome it. The, those are the things that I feel like as a coach you live for. Uh, you know, the, the great wins and the tough losses are memorable to an extent, but they, they tend to bleed together. It's, it's those moments that you think back on. I just enjoyed that drive with, with those guys to an individual tournament or just spending a week with this guy, um, you know, at a, at a fall event or spending this time with the team, you know, out in, in Palm Springs was, was a memorable experience, whether we did well or, or not. Um, I think it's, it's the totality of the experience of, of having the unique opportunity to get to know these young men at, at such a, a deep level uh, and have a real impact. I mean, in tennis, you, you are spending an, an inordinate amount of time with a few guys. Uh, and you make you know, can can have such a positive influence on them, um, and it but it comes with great responsibility. But I, I would say that's the the thing that I love the most. That's been my favorite moment is just being able to continue these relationships, both watching guys grow. Connie's been here this whole time with me to see him go from freshman year to now being a fifth year, and, and what a great captain he's become for this team and a leader and. Uh, just so proud of him. Um, and that happens, you know, uh, every year seeing guys go off and 
um, it, it's been, it, that's an incredible part of it. And I think something that I find to be my greatest memories. Um, that being said, I know everybody wants to know, well, what is this match, you know, uh, that, that really stuck in your mind. I would say my first year, um, our team came back from 3-0 down against Southern Cal in the finals of Indian Wells. Um, Max uh, Chitaki came back and clinched against USC, you know, to win 4-3 and 6-4 in the third set. And, and there was a dog pile and it was unbelievable. Um, and I remember because they don't let me forget that I was standing over them with my phone out. Um, and there's a photo, the photographer took a picture of the whole dog pile and then I'm standing right next to it on my phone. It looks like I'm just looking at my phone right after the match ended. They still give me a hard time to this day. I was, I got my phone out because they always gave me a hard time. When there's a dog pile, you got to make sure to take a picture of it because we've missed a couple in the past. So I was thinking, I'm being a good, good coach. I'm going to get this photo. Next thing you know, there's this huge picture of the whole team with the dog pile and me just standing next to it with, the, with my phone out. Um, but that was an amazing match. I think it was probably Max's um, greatest memory, um, you know, just individually to, to be able to clinch that. But just the team coming back, we were down and out to come back from 3-0 to win. That was really cool. Um, and then I, I think beating the, the eventual national champions, Texas, in the Big 12 finals in 2019 was an incredible experience. I think, you know, the, those guys, uh, Shredder, Little, and Bendek, I mean, they, they had put a lot of pressure on themselves um, because they had not won a Big 12 championship. And I think they were the first ones in 20 years that were down to their last chance. Uh, we didn't win the regular season. We we were even a little bit banged up. I and mean, Jimmy didn't barely played in the conference tournament. And uh, the performances that all of the guys put on in order to win that match was um, was really special. And to see Adrian as, as a first semester freshman clinch, that was really cool. Um, so I would say those are probably the two matches that stand out the most to me. The uh, spring schedule got released recently, open up Friday uh, with Lamar and ACU um play a, i think a double header with smu on monday go to the uh, ita indoor or, or go to the kickoff weekend are there some specific dates that you've got circled right now i mean or yeah i mean they're all big i guess we can say that right but are there some specific dates that you're really looking forward to more than ever um you know we're excited about every chance that we have to play uh, every match is a big match. I think our guys are looking at it as every match is our last opportunity to play. You just never know uh, right now when, when we're going to have another chance to compete. So we're very much looking forward to Friday uh, and, and trying not to talk about it too much. Just one, one solid practice day at a time and Friday will be upon us soon. Um, that being said, uh, we've got a heck of a home schedule. Um, and, and really a heck of a road schedule. I mean, the, the team is the level. That's really what they need to, to play this type of a, of a schedule. But I think if I were to point out one date, um, you know, certainly uh, TCU in January at home is going to be a lot of fun. Um, but I think as far as for the fans to get excited about, uh, it's going to be senior day um, against Texas April 18th. Uh, I think by that time we'll have, you know, 25% capacity at the herd. It'll still be a nice crowd. Um, and so I think it's going to be a lot of fun. It's just, you know, guys that are near and dear to my heart being honored on that day, uh, regardless of the matchup and what our rankings are and it being Baylor and Texas, that's all great. But just an opportunity to honor um, Connie and and Ryan for their, you know, long um, uh, careers here at Baylor, particularly Connie, and then uh, to, to be able to honor Nick and Spencer and Charlie as well. I mean, those five guys by – by that time in the year will have made huge impacts on this program. And they've just been a, a fantastic um, group of young men that I think deserve our celebration. So really looking forward to that moment. Um, and I know that, you know, they all deserve it, you know, carrying over even from, you know, outside of Connie, the schools that they came from, they never really had that opportunity. Um, so to be able to celebrate the totality of their careers, I think will be really special. Might set a Baylor record for senior day, right? I mean, in terms of ones being honored. Five, yeah, five is a lot. Um, <laughs> five is a lot. So yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a very busy and long winded senior day, I'm sure. Um, but it will be very special, and also excited that that won't be the last time we play at home. So we can really take in the moment since we host the Big Twelve tournament, and, and hopefully, um, you know, uh, if we do well enough, we can host some uh, some rounds in the NCAA tournament as well. Yeah. Uh, Michael, I guess, how cool is that to be able to host the Big 12 championships? I know Baylor has, 
a few other times, obviously, but just to have that kind of event here. And I know even looking ahead, we've got the NCAAs at some point, but hosting the big 12 championships here. That's a huge honor. I mean, it's, it's such a, a, a high level display of tennis. I mean, you, you could argue that we have the best, um, we have the best conference in the country for, for men's tennis. And it's same. I would say the same It's close in women's tennis as well. And so just to have, this level of tennis on display here in Waco at, at to me, the best facility in the country. Uh, it, it's such an honor and it, to me, it's a no brainer. So we're so very, very excited to host that. I know the guys love to play at home. It's, we have a, we have a distinct advantage at home. Uh, and so we, we love to play in front of a great crowd and play on our home courts and uh, just enjoy that, that experience. I know um, the guys that have not had the opportunity to play here um, in the Big 12 tournament are very excited about it. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Well, let's wrap it up with this. Um, as we try to give the fans a little glimpse into this team, is there something about them that maybe they don't already know? Uh, are there anybody that you worry about, like you can't turn your back on that might be a jokester or prankster, might, might do the uh, burning? Great uh, question. Two years ago, I would have said Jamie Bendek. Um, you know, I think we have a little bit more uh, straight and narrow group uh, now. But, uh, you know, the guys that you have to watch out for are, are, are Ryan Dickerson and Raul Dokia. I mean, th those guys will, will chop it up a little bit uh, and, and definitely keep things light. Um, and the, the banter is flowing for sure. Um, you know, it's good. I, I think it's really good for the guys um, on the team. It, it kind of, you know, we've got some very serious professional uh, discipline guys and, and they are as well. I think it's just knowing when to, to mess around and when not to. And I think Spencer does a fantastic job with them. Um, th those guys never cross the line, but they find the line and they nestle right up next to it. So uh, it definitely keeps things light. And uh, I think it's good for the, for the squad. All right. Hey, Michael, thanks for this. Uh, enjoyed uh, getting to know you a little better, getting to know the program a little better. And we're, I know we're excited about what this season holds and uh, just excited to see what you guys uh, do this year. Well, thanks, Jerry. I appreciate your time. Very excited to get going. I think this is going to be a very special group of young men uh, this year. So just happy to be a part of it. Excited to, to cheer them on here in a couple of days. Sick them bears. Sick them. <laughs>